Good afternoon. It's, it's a great honor and privilege uh, to be invited to give uh, this year's McClure lecture. And I thank the organizers for great hospitality and um, for making this such a warm and uh, purposeful visit. Uh, friends, in the last few years, there has been an intriguing debate about whether we are living in the best of times or the worst of times. Let me illustrate this debate in three areas for you. One, violence and danger. Global news coverage suggests that our world is in the grip of escalating violence and harmful threats. Destructive wars uh, continue in Syria, South Sudan, Ukraine, and other parts of the world. Terrorist attacks remain uh, uh, an imminent threat. Mass shootings and police violence uh, here and elsewhere. Yet, experts claim that our world is safer in the early 21st century than it has ever been. For most of human history, about 15% of people in the world died violently. And as recently as a century ago, global average life expectancy was in the early 30s. Today it is 71. Two, disease and the environment. Widespread hunger, disease, and increasingly frequent natural disasters have raised serious questions about the fate of our planet. Yet, researchers insist that not only are humans actually more safe, we are also wealthier, healthier, more free, less hungry, and more literate than ever before. In 2015, for the first time ever, less than 10% of the global population lived in extreme poverty. Three, globalization. The peoples and societies of the world have never been more interconnected and integrated. Thanks to the technologies of travel and the transformative impact of social media tools, over one billion people log on to Facebook every day. I don't know if you know this, there are more mobile devices in the world than there are people. Some other day we will talk about who is winning that <laughs> war. Yet in many ways, communities around the world remain as disconnected as ever. You may be interested to know that less than 2% of phone calling minutes involve international calls. The vast majority of internet traffic are domestic. And actually, Social media tends to make us less social. We primarily use it to interact with people we already know. So yes, uh, human society has never been more connected, but studies increasingly show we have become more tribal in our thinking and associations. See, it's complicated. But I want to suggest this afternoon that few areas demonstrate the complex interactions between the global and the local, uh, whether we're the worst of times and the best of times, than migration. In the interest of full disclosure, let me state that according to the UN definition, I have been an international migrant for about 28 years. I left my native Sierra Leone in 1990, a year before the outbreak of a brutal 10-year civil war. So yes, I honestly have a personal stake in these reflections. But they're also the fruit of study and research going back a few decades. As of 2015, according to UN estimates, there were 244 million international migrants in the world. 
the highest number of people living abroad in recorded history. If they all lived in the same place, that place would be the world's fifth largest country. Generally speaking, there are more people on the move today globally than ever before. The refugee crisis that's been much discussed has seen the highest number of recorded refugees in history. Some 65 plus million people who have fled their homes because of conflict, persecution, and violence. In 2015, 24 people fled their homeland every minute. And nearly one in every 200 children in the world is a child refugee. And much of this movement is marked by immeasurable human suffering and anguish. At the same time, the global migrant crisis has triggered widespread resentment and hostility towards foreigners and outsiders. Well, there is not... And there should not be a single Christian response to this issue. But for those who are familiar with the literature, Roman Catholics have been the most engaged and effective in terms of meaningful pastoral, ecclesial, and theological responses to migration. I've said this before, that in my own experience, uh, teaching and uh, giving talks in schools and congregations around this country, American Christians who attend church regularly mainly derive their attitudes and convictions on the issue of immigration not from pastoral guidance, not from biblical teaching and reflection, but from the particular political ideologies in the wider society with which they are aligned. In fact, there is now growing indication that Christian responses so this deeply complex issue of immigration are primarily nationalistic. We'll return to this in a minute. But first, I want to make the case that both in theological education and Christian ministry, thoughtful reflection on the implications of migration for the church must be shaped by a biblical perspective. Friends, we encounter every major form of migration in the biblical account. You might say that the spirit of migration permeates the biblical record and defines biblical religion. I would make the case that the biblical story and message would be meaningless without migration and mobility. And I want to suggest this afternoon that a biblical view of migration must consider these three major themes. First, in the biblical record, Yahweh's purposes and designs repeatedly unfold within the experience of migration and dislocation. It is very often the case that the men and women who receive divine commissioning are for the most part individuals whose lives reflected displacement. Abraham is the most familiar. The vulnerability and risks associated with displacement and uprootedness indelibly shape his life. He constantly crossed borders, had his share of dealings with immigration officials, even experienced the uncertainty of his large family being denied refugee status. It is as a migrant that Abraham grows in faith and receives the promises of God. But it's not only Abraham. It was as a migrant refugee that Moses stood before the burning bush. Or more accurately, the bush that would not burn. Jacob spent most of his life as a fugitive. It was as a migrant traveler that he wrestled with the angel all night and had his name changed. He also acquired a limp from that encounter, if you would recall. And this is significant because in Jacob's day, men traveled on foot everywhere. And so that story continues with an account of the long journey he makes to be reunited with Esau. And Jacob says these words in Genesis 13, 
33, 13. That I must move along slowly at the pace of the flocks and herds and the pace of the children. Friends, it was to migrants, more precisely landless refugees, that the law and the Ten Commandments were given. And as you know very well, the God of Israel commanded specific treatment of migrants and outsiders as a hallmark of relationship with him. Not only that, Yahweh designates his people as migrants. We read in Leviticus 27, 23, the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. And this Old Testament law and covenant incorporates specific instructions about treatment of the foreigner and the alien. Love the alien as yourself. The Israelites are uh, uh, instructed in Leviticus 19. And you are to have the same law for the foreigner and the native born. Leviticus 24. Friends, it could not be clearer. To be in a covenant relationship with this God is incompatible with rejection of, discrimination against, or exclusion of the foreigner or stranger. Second, from a biblical perspective, migration emerges as a metaphor for the life of faith. By which I mean that the fact of being a foreigner or an outsider is repeatedly affirmed as a badge of identity for those who live under God's promise. Abraham is celebrated as a model of faith precisely because, as we read in Hebrews 11, he went even though he did not know where he was going and lived like a stranger in a foreign country. Even after settlement in the promised land, the migrant identity remains etched in Israel's religious consciousness. We often forget that David, another prominent biblical model, spent an extended period of time as a migrant, a refugee, and asylum seeker. After he became king of Israel, he remained deeply conscious of the link between the experience of migration and the religious identity of his people. So in this prayer, in 1 Chronicles, he says, We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors. Thirdly, throughout the Old Testament, the most significant missionary encounters involve migration. In almost every instance, where non-Israelites recognize the lordship of Yahweh and turn to him in worship, migrant action is involved. This happens again and again. Migrants are agents of mission. Joseph, Joshua, Daniel, the Babylonian exiles, Ruth, Esther, even Jonah. My favorite story is the story of Naaman, the Syrian. This story begins with a testimony to the power of the God of Israel by a refugee. An Israelite girl held captive in Syria. And the outcome of that story is that Naaman will declare to never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. This theme of, my, theme of migration becomes even more prominent in the New Testament. The Gospel writers leave us in no doubt that Jesus' life experiences were distinctively shaped by the experience of migration and travel. Joseph and Mary traveled more than 90 miles from Galilee to his hometown in Judea, a journey that took up to a week before Jesus was born. And soon after he is born, the family becomes refugees. Jesus spends his entire ministry as an itinerant preacher, constantly crossing boundaries, constantly experiencing what it means to be the outsider who does not belong. We see the picture of the travel of a refugee, the pain of uprootedness, the hostility 
that greets the unwelcome outsider. In Jesus' own words in Luke 9, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It is also interesting that Galilee, the region where Jesus spends most of his ministry, was dominated by Gentiles. In fact, in Scripture, it's referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles. It is interesting that when the long-awaited Jewish Messiah eventually appears, he does not conduct his ministry in any of the hearts, sites, or locations of Judaism, but in a city where Gentiles outnumber Jews. In fact, from a Jewish perspective, if you would recall, Galilee is described as the land where people live in darkness. This is where Jesus conducts his ministry. Pirillion, the outsider, and crucially, he, he identifies himself in Matthew 25 as a stranger. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Friends, I will not dwell on the expansion of the church, but migration remained critical in the spread, the identity, the survival of the new community of faith. Even the name Christian emerges out of refugee movement. Like many new movements in the Roman Empire, Christianity drew its earliest members from the migrant sections of the populations in many cities. It is a fact that the church in Rome mainly comprised immigrants. As a matter of fact, much of our New Testament was addressed to immigrant groups. It's hardly rocket science to discern that the role of migration and migrants only intensified as our faith spread globally. With very rare exceptions, the earliest community of believers in every society and culture around the world first heard the gospel from migrants. So how should we think about our own realities today? Migration is now at the heart of the most serious predicaments and challenges confronting Christians and Christian congregations. The pro proportion of our citizens and neighbors who have an immigrant background will continue to grow. The plight of migrants and the transformations associated with migration influx will continue to require specific resp responses from us as part of our weakness. I believe three issues merit urgent attention. In this slide, you're going to see the image of Ireland Cuddy. You may remember him. Ireland Cuddy was the three-year-old Syrian boy who drowned on a Turkish beach in September 2015. That image circulated around the world, triggered gut-wrenching reactions, and then faded from memory. Here are the three issues I would suggest require our attention as a church. First, the reassertion of a nationalist identity within Western Christianity. As I mentioned earlier, there are now strong indications that Christian responses to these deeply complex issues of immigration are increasingly nationalistic. A recent survey of 15 countries in Western Europe concluded that while a majority of adults, about 64%, identify as Christian, only 18% attend church regularly, by which they mean, and this will be a surprise to some of you, once a month. 
But even more important, the servant made two major discoveries relevant to us. First, that Christian identity is associated with higher levels of negative attitudes towards immigrants and religious minorities. In other words, those who self-identify as Christians, whether they attend church or not, are more likely than those who do not to express negative views of immigrants as well as other religious groups, including Muslims and Jews. And second, that Christians as a whole increasingly place greater priority on nationalist identity than on religious allegiance or commitment. Friends, this means that while churches continue to play a leading role in providing meaningful humanitarian response to the plight of migrants, there is a growing tendency among Christians and congregations to put cultural identity before allegiance to Christ or the values of the kingdom in their response to immigration. It's not only Western Europe that this data, which this data addresses. I have had a similar discussions in other parts of the world, including New Zealand and Australia, uh, just a year ago. What of the U.S.? Well, how many of you think the American situation is different from the, what you're reading on the slide? Can I see hands? We have one or two. So, Americans overall are considerably more religious than Western Europeans. Roughly 75% of the population uh, claims a Christian identity, and some 47% attend church regularly. Again, one, at least once a month. But we are witnessing, in my view, the same trends. Generally speaking, uh, American Protestantism in particular, has been moving in the same direction. By the way, American Protestantism generally has always had a nationalist impulse uh, or strand to it. But the data now also confirms that religious conservatism is linked to more negative attitudes towards uh, immigrants. And again and again, national identity tends to supersede those Christian commitments that we ought to hold dear. I want to suggest to you that this is a profoundly disturbing development with serious implications for Christian life and the church's ministry. I am not suggesting that Christians ought to be immune to the economic or cultural concerns that fuel the wider debate and concerns. My primary issue is, or my primary concern today is to name the fact that the growth of this nationalistic Christianity presents a danger to our Christian unity and witness. I don't have the answer. But I think we have to make the case now that as a church we need a clear counter-narrative in this very divisive and heated debate. Migration is one of the most defining issues of our time. It is shaping daily existence. Uh, in addition to economic and cultural or social effects, it is impacting communities in important ways. It has implications uh, for Christianity in the Western world. However you think about it, immigration will have a decisive impact on the future of American Christianity. How we respond to the plight of immigrants and the transformations associated with migration says a lot about our theology. It also says a lot about our priorities, our commitments, our witness, and our understanding 
of divine purpose. So my second point. The immigrants of global migration in the church's ministry and Christian witness will also necessitate dealing with social hostility and religious plurality as a missionary priority. The scale of global migratory flows are mind-boggling. And actually, I quoted data earlier. Uh, in, in migrant studies, uh, we know that when you quote the data, it's already outdated. Such is the upsurge, the dynamism of migra migration movements in our time. Credible statistics are really lacking for much of the phenomenon and many aspects of it. What is clear is that the global migrant crisis, as it is often referred to these days, has generated much debate, resentment, hostility in many parts of the world. And by the way, not only within Western societies. Even in non-Western or developing countries, immigrants face tremendous hostility and hardship. In India, it is immigrants from Bangladesh that are the, bear the brunt of resentment. In Pakistan, there are moves to uh, uh, expel hundreds of thousands of Afghan immigrants. In Gabon and Equatorial Guinea, it is migrants from Central Africa that receive the brunt of hostility. In South Africa, as some of you might know, anti-foreigner riots and xenophobic unrest in 2011 led to over 60 deaths. I was visiting a professor in Brazil just four months ago, and the dramatic rise in Venezuelan refugees fleeing economic collapse, crime, hunger, and oppression has generated widespread public anxiety within Brazil and calls to close the border. So friends, more people are fleeing conflict and hardship than at any other time in history. Yet as of 2015, fewer than 1% of the 20 million refugees were resettled in another nation. But as we reflect on this issue, we're called on as a church to confront the hostility and resentment surrounding the debates and the questions. It is my view that we must reject the populist rhetoric that suggests that immigration is in and of itself the problem. The belief that national identity is under threat from foreign cultures merits a response. But the exclusive nationalism that is being championed by many extreme sections of our society and finding room in the hearts of those in our congregations and pews needs to be challenged. Immigration may be a factor, but across the globe, the worst acts of violence and hostility are rooted in cultural and ethnic division. White nationalist groups in Europe and North America that reject any association across boundaries of blood and soil may be on the rise. But in Germany, for instance, the AFD, the Populist Radical Right Party, made explicit efforts to earn the support of the 3.1 million white ethnic German immigrants from the Soviet Union. While at the same time mounting hate-filled rhetoric against non-white immigrants from Africa and the Middle East. In many areas, the most antagonistic responses to immigrants are rooted in hostility related to race and religion. Incidentally, 
studies show that some 73% of the world's population are affected by hostilities involving religion. I hope you are listening. Hostilities involving religion. 73% of the world's population are affected. Friends, that's over 5 billion people who are facing hostility in the form of assault, intimidation, physical abuse, vandalism of property, other kinds of uh, uh, reactions because of religious life, belief, or identity. So we must also consider that as the Christian faith has spread globally, many of the members of our own family, our brothers and sisters, daily confront the challenge of living with integrity as Christians in the midst of religious plurality. Friends, hostility between faiths is not an inevitability. So, I grew up in Sierra Leone. I grew up as a Christian in a predominantly Muslim country. Percentage of Christians in Sierra Leone is anywhere between 10 or 15, by most counts. Sierra Leone is also located in a region of the world with one of the highest levels of religious diversity. But here is what you need to know, and you can fact check this one. Sierra Leone has a long history of religious coexistence and peaceful interaction. I'm not talking about religious tolerance. You don't tolerate people you accept and love. I'm talking about religious acceptance and accommodation. Muslims and Christians live and walk together, attend each other's ceremonies and places of worship. Conversions tend to move uh, in both directions. Intermarriage is common. There is tremendous Christian growth in Sierra Leone, as in many parts of Africa or West Africa. Even while we had a Muslim president, I'm not suggesting that the Sierra Leone context is problem free. Remember, I mentioned that 10 year civil war. What I'm saying is that cultural accommodation and living one's faith with integrity is not only possible, it should now become part of our consciousness and part of our witness. Because in many parts of the world, Christians do exist as minority communities. For them, religious plurality is not a challenge that they try to overcome. It is an essential dimension of their existence. They are minorities. For them, religious dialogue is not a planned event or an occasional conversation. It's a way of life. So when we think about missionary engagement in this context that are being generated by migrant movement and increased interactions between cultures and religions, we may well need to think about the Roman Catholic theologian Robert Schreiter's uh, observation that missionary engagement must now include the dialogue of social action, quote unquote. What it means by this is an approach in which Christian communities collaborate with other traditions for the sake of the community in which they live as well. When they serve with others on common projects to address common societal issues, bring peace and bring transformation in communities. Stand up with others to confront violence and stand up for victims of oppression, regardless of their faith or background. The American context is going to be, for the foreseeable future, increasingly shaped by non-white immigration. 
and it's already having significant impact on America's religious landscape. The population of Muslims has been steadily growing, as has been the populations of Buddhists and Hindus. Religious encounters between these different groups, even conversions between religious groups, are more likely to emerge from these interactions that are unprecedented. And by the way, the religious pluralism I'm, dis I'm describing also includes secularists. As of 2014, 23% of Americans claim to be religiously unaffiliated. So we're living in a context that's increasingly shaped by plurality of religious identity practices and allegiance. This growing plurality invites us to proclaim Christ crucified with courage and wisdom, and at the same time earnestly seek fruitful engagement, even collaboration with people of other faiths traditions. Virtually everywhere in the world today, effective Christian witness requires a whole of society engagement. A commitment to expose and challenge racial and cultural prejudice and fight discrimination in church and society. A strong stance against violence towards immigrants. And yet also Thoughtful engagement with the anxieties and concerns within the wider society that often find expression in anti-immigrant sentiment. Thirdly and lastly, in this age of global migration, as we reflect on our witness and as we reflect on issues of unity, I want to suggest that we should recall and place at the forefront of our consciousness this fact that migration is integral to the mission of the church. Whether we like it or not, our Christian faith and heritage ultimately rests or has roots in the actions of migrants and foreigners. Today, more than ever before, the church is on the move. Almost half of the world's international migrants are Christian. Members of our family, members of our household of faith, are among the foreign-born populations that are increasingly the focus of xenophobia, hatred, even violence in many parts of the world. Friends, America is home to more international migrants than any country. But I need you to take on board this fact that at least 70% of these new migrants who have flocked into this country over the last four to five decades. At least 70% are Christian. The high proportion of Christians among the world's migrants is a reflection of the fact that the global church is now mainly centered in parts of the world that are experiencing high levels of instability, violence, and hardship. 21st century Christianity is predominantly non-white. The majority of the world's Christians live outside the West. More than about half live in Africa and Latin America. More Christians worldwide today speak Spanish than any other language. So it should be of concern to us that in many parts of the West, relations between Christian immigrant communities and homegrown churches are marked by dissociation and tension. For many in our congregations, 
a radical mental shift and maybe a spiritual revival is needed to lift up the realization that migration and many forms of immigration present the church with abundant and unexpected gifts in terms of Christian witness and new forms of ministry. Migration has brought diverse Christian communities in closer proximity than ever before, with unprecedented opportunities for mutual engagement and intercultural partnership in the work of, the, of God's kingdom. Once again, it is clear that migrants feature prominently in the divine plan and purpose and play a central role in the expansion of the faith. In this country, the fastest growing churches and congregations are migrant churches and congregations. The fastest growing churches and congregations are those that include a diverse city of people and welcome the largest number from different cultural backgrounds and social realities. You see, for too long, our missionary assumption and models have emphasized structures, economic calculation, planned initiatives. The new global reality calls for approaches that look beyond structures of power and visions of domination. Certainly would require a rejection of a nationalist identity that treats others as outsiders and inferior. Mission in our time is not the privilege of any one culture, nation, or race. Mission in our time must reflect a prophetic voice that speaks to the church as well as from the church. So I would say to you, whether it is the best of times or the worst of times misses the point. The spread of God's kingdom is not fully measurable by human standards, nor does it fully conform to human expectations. But at a minimum, partaking in God's mission calls for a readiness to see Christ in the stranger, the refugee, and the outcast. Thank you.